Hi, I'm just going to do a quick walkthrough on how to find the magnetic field generated by a current loop anywhere in space. Uh, the point we're going to be finding the field at is the point P, and we're going to use cylindrical coordinates to define um, our problem. So the point P is a distance R from the z-axis, it's at a height of z from the xy plane, and we're only going to solve it for one angle, and that would be zero. Because of the symmetry of the problem, we can solve it for just one slice and use that to calculate the full solution. The current loop is in the xy plane and it has a current of i flowing through it in a counterclockwise direction. Now the way we're going to find the magnetic field is by first finding the magnetic vector potential. Um, it's just a scalar multiplied by a line integral dl over s. Now dl is just our infinitesimal line segment down here and S is the distance from that line segment to the point P that we want to find the magnetic field at. So we're going to integrate that from 0 to 2 pi around the current loop. I've just added the um, X and Y components of DL just to show uh, a point that I'll just come to in a second. Now, what we can see here is the X component is in the negative direction and the Y component is in the negative direction for this point. Now if we go to the opposite side of the circle, S is still the same length, but X is in the positive direction now, and Y is still in the negative direction, so what that means is the X component cancels out, and we're only left with the Y component. Now I'll just show that down here again. The X component is in the positive direction, the Y component is in the positive direction as well. If we go to the other side, where S is going to be the same length, same distance from the point that we're trying to find the magnetic field at, x is in the negative direction now and y is in the positive direction. So once again the x component has cancelled out. We're going to leave all that in the equation at the moment and the maths will show that that will drop out, but you could just leave that out, but we'll work through the whole thing. Okay, the next step we're going to do is we're just going to add the angle phi, which is the angle we're going to use for the integration and a which is just the radius we're also going to introduce a distance b that's just going to help us calculate the length s here from p to our um, infinitesimal line segment dl um, now we're going to use these equations here to calculate the length of s if we use the cosine rule here it's just b squared is equal to r squared plus a squared minus 2ra cos phi and then if we just use simple Pythagoras, we get b squared plus z squared is equal to s squared. Substitute that into that, and we get this expression here for the length of s. We're just going to use these two equations here later on in our calculations. dl can also be expressed in terms of d phi, which is the change in the angle um, of integration. So it's just d phi multiplied by the radius multiplied by the unit vector E phi, which is tangential to the circle here. Now E phi is also broken down into this equation here, which just represents it in Cartesian coordinates and makes the integration pretty simple. Okay, we'll just start by restating our equations. I've added this one here. The magnetic field is equal to the curl of the magnetic vector potential. These other equations are just the same as we've already seen. And then we just substitute them in to get this expression here, which basically allows us to derive an i and j component. So we just need to do two separate integrations um, to calculate ai and aj. Okay, we'll start with an easy one first. Um, we'll calculate ai. Now to do that, we need to evaluate this integral down here, and we've used a bit of a trick to do that. We've got a function up the top here, and when we take its derivative, it's basically what we want to find the integral of. There is a scaling factor of r involved, and we just need to move that outside the integral, but apart from that, it's pretty simple. And then we just evaluate this function over the interval 0 to 2 pi, and we come up with 0. Um, you can look at this. And just by inspection, you can tell that the answer should be zero. On the denominator here, this cos term means it's symmetrical about pi between zero and two pi. And on the numerator, 
the sign term here means it's anti-symmetric about pi between 0 and 2 pi. So overall, this term here will be anti-symmetric um, over the interval 0 to 2 pi about pi. So the integral between 0 and pi should be the negative of the integral between pi and 2 pi, which means they'll cancel out and you'll just get 0. Now onto aj, which is a little bit more complicated. It turns out that the integral down here that we need to evaluate is actually an elliptic integral. Now in this case, the best we can hope for is to get into a form that's a little bit nicer to work with because there aren't any closed form solutions. Now the first step towards that goal is a change of variables. So phi equals pi minus 2 theta. We're going to take that in two different directions and then substitute it into this equation which we've done down the bottom here. We then come to this step here. We're going to use the fact that the integrand here is an even function. That arises from the sine squared theta term here and here. So instead of integrating between minus pi on 2 and pi on 2, we're now going to integrate between 0 and pi on 2, and then multiply that answer by 2, which is what we've done in this step here. We're now one step closer to having our integral in the form of a complete elliptic integral, because our interval of integration is now 0 to pi on 2. The next step, we've just taken out all these variables here, which are basically constants in this integration because we're integrating with respect to theta. We now make this substitution as well, which gets us one step closer to having our integral in the form of a complete elliptic integral. Uh, down the bottom here, we now have 1 minus k squared sine squared theta, which is what we're after. And just to make things simpler later on, we're going to do this last substitution here which is just taking all the stuff out the front of the integral and replacing it with a lambda term, just so we have less things to write down later. Now what we're doing on this page is getting this integral here into the form of complete elliptic integrals, which we've done down here. This term here turns out to be a complete elliptic integral of the first kind, and this is an integral of the second kind. Now the reason we're doing that is, although we can't calculate these analytically, there are tables we can use to look up these values that have been pre-calculated. Now what we've done here is just replace the integrals we've just seen with the functions e1 of k and e2 of k, which are complete elliptical integrals of the first and second kind, respectively. So that gives us an answer for aj, and we've previously calculated ai to be 0, and we can substitute them into our original equation to give an expression for the vector magnetic potential, which we've got here. Now it's only one component in the j direction. Now this is only solved for phi equals zero. So when phi equals zero, j is actually equal to e phi, which is our unit vector that's tangential to the radial vector. So we can actually replace that j term with the e phi vector, just down here as you can see. Now due to the axial symmetry of the problem, this solution will be valid for all values of phi. That's because this unit vector here will actually change as the value of phi changes. All we need to do now is calculate the magnetic field by taking the curl of the magnetic vector potential, which is what we've done here. Um, we've used cylindrical coordinates for that. We need these relationships here to calculate that. Uh, these I'll show you later on. And because that can get quite involved, it's not complicated, it's just a lot of work. I've used maxima to calculate those values, and this is the answer we get here. So we have a z component and an r component, a radial component, to the magnetic field. I won't go through this, but it's just simple differentiation. We're finding dk dz here. Uh, same thing here, we're just finding dk dr. And this is the code Maxima uses. Like I said, it's not complicated, it's just a lot of uh, fiddly work and it's easy to make a mistake so using software to do it is a lot simpler and smarter really. As you can see these equations get rather long but in the end when they're simplified they reduce down to a simple equation. Now if we come back here and have a look at our solution that we've obtained you may be wondering how useful it actually is and to be honest it's not that useful at all really. Uh, most situations in the real world pretty much all of them in fact, are going to be a lot more complicated than just a simple current loop. So they won't reduce to nice equations like this. 
What you'll actually end up doing is putting your model into a finite element package and a computer will solve it for you. Now, apart from satisfying our theoretical curiosity, we do get to see how some of the variables interact here, which is one advantage, and it's a bit of fun anyway. Okay, I'll post this PDF on my website, and along with that, I'll post the maximum files I use to calculate the final answer. Hope this helps, and thanks for watching.